Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to, to... In spite of these devices, could you kind of speak a little bit louder? Okay. So I'm going to, to, to talk about recent work uh, which we did with this group of people over the past two years, which shows some parallels between well, as the title says, anti the Seater space time and Bose-Einstein condensates. But I will begin with a much more general setting, uh, and these are just two examples of this. Uh, okay, so this. So we have the first problems at this. Hmm. I don't know. Something happened to my laptop. So. Okay. I start over again. So there are two, two different kinds of infinite dimensional Hamiltonian systems or nonlinear wave equations. Uh, one class is called sometimes extended Hamiltonian systems, and they are defined on unbounded domains. And the second class are specially confined systems, which are defined on bounded domains or on compact manifolds, or there is some kind of trapping uh, in the system. And dynamics of waves for these two systems is fundamentally different. So for extended systems, there is a mechanism which stabilizes the evolution and is responsible for asymptotic stability of many coherent structures. And this is dissipation of energy by radiation. So for example, if you throw a stone into a pond, you create concentric ripples that propagate outwards, and eventually the water comes to rest. And the same mechanism is responsible for stability of Minkowski spacetime or stability of Kerr. Well, no, I'm assuming an ideal situation where there are no dissipative forces. They will not, because there is a dis... Yes. But the amplitude will be smaller and smaller and finer. Yes. Yes, that's why I'm talking about Hamiltonian systems. There is no dissipation. So, the, of course, if there is local dissipation, then go, going to rest is trivial. So, uh, but right. for Hamiltonian... The dissipation is probably a bit misleading. Right? Uh, no, this is... Uh, yeah, that's what, it's not a local dissipation. Yeah. It's a dissipation which is due to the... So if you, if you concentrate on any compact region... Well, in, in mathematical literature, this is called dissipation by this person. It's not local, it's global dissipation. But anyway, 
However, if you do the same experiment with a stone in a basin or a pool, then waves propagate outwards and they bounce off the wall and they return and they interact with waves which are still propagating outwards. And this leads to very complicated nonlinear wave interactions. And for this reason, the question of stability of such systems, which are specially confined, is much more challenging than for unbounded domains. Very little is known. And, and one of the key questions for such systems is whether energy you inject into the system can flow to arbitrarily large frequencies or arbitrarily small scales. This is the same. So, for example, you can think about the wind which induces waves on the, on the sea. And the question is, will, will the energy go to arbitrarily small special scales, which will produce more and more rapid oscillations? And this is the question of so-called weak turbulence. So weak turbulence is a phenomenon when energy does flow to arbitrarily high frequencies in infinite time. Uh, and uh, very little is known about this. And just to give you an example of a very simple system uh, uh, for which we don't know the answer. So, so imagine uh, this equation. Uh, this is in one special, so u is a function, it's in one special dimension, u is a function of t and x on a finite interval. with fixed endpoints. So say the interval is from 0 to p, from p with, with fixed endpoints. So obviously u equal to 0 is a solution of this equation. And this is because there is a plus sign here, which means that nonlinearity is repulsive. Uh, the energy of this solution, which is 0, is a, minimal, is a minimal possible energy, it's a ground state of this system. However, it is not known whether this state is stable. Uh, so by the, this I mean that, for example, if you, of course energy is conserved for this, but if you say take a second special derivative of the solution and square it and integrate from zero to pi and let's say take a square root. This object is called the second Sobolev norm of this solution. And the question is, can this norm become unbounded as time goes to infinity? And the problem is open. It is not known if this norm can become unbounded. And you should keep this elementary example in mind when I will talk about a corresponding problem for Well, well, if I would drop one derivative, this would yeah, this yeah, is yeah. obviously b b because this is con this is this is this controlled by energy. The fact that it becomes un this this kind of higher norm inspect this weak turbulence phenomenon. If this becomes unbound, it means that the, the solutions become oscillate more and more rapidly as time goes on. It means that the, the, the frequency of oscillations goes to infinity, as time goes to infinity, if this, if this goes unbound. So, so let me give you some examples of specially confined systems. So the first is, is just the example I gave, a nonlinear string. Uh, Another example is the wave equation on a compact manifold. So say a cubic Klein-Gordon equation on, on three-dimensional sphere. Uh, or uh, Einstein equations with negative cosmological. So here the uh, confinement is due to the fact that we are on a sphere. So this is a compact manifold. This is these are Einstein equations with negative cosmological constant coupled to a scalar field. Uh, I will uh, show you a little bit later why this is a confined system. Here, the confinement fac comes from the fact that there is time-like boundary at infinity, 
at which waves bounce back. And finally, well, there is a confinement can come from a trapping potential. So this is a gross Pitayevsky equation in two dimensions with a harmonic potential and a cubic nonlinearity. So here the, the sp space is unbounded by the recent trapping potential. So, so what is the general strategy of studying such system? The third example, uh, the scalar function phi fulfills why? Uh, fulfills uh, uh, the wave equation, and this wave equation follows. So. Linear wave equations on coupled to this, but yeah. but this follows. So if you just this follows through Bianchi identity for this, so it's not so equation of motion for matter follow from Einstein equations in this case. Sometimes, Sometimes they don't, but in this case they do. Yeah. Uh, now the, let me sketch a general strategy. Uh, so first observation is that if the system is specially confined then the spectrum of linearized perturbation is discrete, is purely discrete. Well, like here, it's like these are just sine and x are eigenfunctions and all frequencies are integers, one, two, three, and so on. So it is natural to decompose a solution in the basis of these eigenfunctions, right? And when we do this, we convert our system, which is, uh, well, like a non in a wave equation, into an infinite dimensional system of coupled oscillators. And usually people refer to those oscillators as modes. Now, if there was no coupling, then these oscillators would be uncoupled and there would, would be no transfer of energy between oscillators. But there is a coupling, it's a nonlinear system, and the coupling leads to transfer of energy between the modes and this transfer is dominated by interactions which are resonant. I will define in a moment what I mean by resonant interactions. So the resonant interactions dominate transfer of energy. So the key idea is that if they dominate, let's keep only resonant interactions and let's drop all other interactions which are non-resonant. And if, and this, well, this system is fully equivalent to the original system. Once we drop non-resonant non term, well, this becomes an approximation. It's not equivalent, but one can show that this approximation is valid on uh, very long time scales for small amplitude solutions. And this is an idea which goes back to Bogolubov and Krivov. So I, 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 I'll, I'll be more specific in a moment. What, what does it mean that it's a good approximation? So the strategy is, is very simple. So we derive, given a, our nonlinear wave equation, we, 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 we derive a resonant system. We try to understand this system. And once we have this understanding, we try to, to, to export what we learned back to original system. Without friction. All systems are Hamiltonians. So let me illustrate this strategy on this second example which I had on my list, which is, uh, so, uh, which is a, a nonlinear cubic uh, wave equation with this conformal coupling. So th this uh, correction to uh, a wave operator uh, uh, guarantees that this, this operator is conformally invariant. This coefficient 1 over 6, well, it depends on dimension. Uh, so, we co and the metric G on which this field is, well, the space time on which this field is propagating is, uh, is, is a three sphere, which is just a, well, in relativity it's called Einstein cylinder, which is a product of time and three sphere with this metric. And I'm using this example because I will see a little bit later that anti de Sitter space-time is conformal to this metric. So, and because equation is conformal invariant, many properties remain for, for the anti, for anti de Sitter. So we take this equation, and actually note that this equation can be viewed as Klein-Gordon equation. This is a Klein-Gordon equation with unit mass and cubic nonlinearity. 
and it's crucial that the mass is unit. So the, the mass is unit because uh, a scalar curvature of three sphere is six, so one over six is one, and the mass is one. For any other value of mass, uh, 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 nothing what, what I will talk about will hold. So this is in the dimension. It's three three plus ones. Sphere is three-dimensional. Uh, Here, uh, if it's six, normally it would be six over r squared, where r is the radius. Of r is the uh, yes. So because th this problem, yeah, this is has a length scale, and so and the ratio of these two length scales, well, this. Now let's assume for simplicity that solutions depend only on this polar angle x, which runs from zero at the North Pole to pi at, at South Pole. And let's uh, change uh, variables from phi to, to, to v. And then this equation takes this form, which looks very similar to this equation, except that there is this sine squared here. And because we want our field phi to be smooth on the sphere, uh, this ensures, well, to ensure this smoothness, uh, we must impose uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions for V, because if this is smooth, then V must vanish at zero and pi. So it's this equation. So the linear part is exactly the same as for this equation. The nonlinearity is different. So these are, of course, the, uh, the, the the harmonics for, for this problem and the frequencies are and I uh, since uh, it is convenient in this context context to count uh, frequencies well indices from zero so that's why it's not n but n plus one so it's a, okay so that's and now uh, well as I as I said before we expand our solution into these eigenfunctions with some coefficients that depend on time. So, and then our equation is this system of coupled oscillators with these cubic nonlinearities. And these uh, uh, objects, S, with four indices, are called interaction coefficients, and they come from projection, and so these are products of four eigenfunctions. Four because nonlinearity is cubic. So if the nonlinearity was, say, quintic, it would be six eigenfunctions and so on. And next, well, well these uh, solutions of this oscillate uh, with frequencies omega. This is the dominant frequency. And to get rid of these fast oscillations, we, we, we go to interaction picture, so which mathematicians call variation of consonants. So, so it means we, we change variables from C n and derivative of cn to a complex variable beta n and beta n bar. So this is just change of variables. And after this change of variables, this equation takes this form. So as always, by going to interaction uh, representation, we reduce the order of the system. So this is a first order system, infinite system of equations. Now, and each C here, well, is this. So it means there, are, there is a product of, six te of three terms of this form. So altogether, there will be eight factors with different combinations of frequencies in the exponent. And, and these combinations I denote by capital omega. And this capital omega is just well, all possible combinations with all possible combination of signs. And the resonant interactions correspond to terms for which omega is zero. And non-resonant interactions have non-zero omega. And now, why we can drop non-resonant terms? Because if we change to so-called slow time, so I'm assuming that my solutions are small of size epsilon, and I define a new time, tau, which I call slow time, and I also rescale. Uh, uh, note that this equation is uh, actually scale invariant, except for this term. So I rescale alpha to beta. So after this change of variables, 
the terms, well, this, these terms, as if omega is non-zero, they will oscillate very rapidly. Uh, so it's natural to, uh, to neglect them because they, after averaging in time, they will become negligible. So that's uh, the reason why we can neglect such, uh, such terms. And after doing this, well, we keep only resonant term, we do some rescalings, which just to simplify, we arrive at this system. So this is an infinite dimensional uh, Hamiltonian system, which is autonomous. Uh, if you compute this uh, interaction coefficient, this is easy because this is a product of trigonometric functions. You find that these uh, interaction coefficients are just given by this formula. This is a minimum of these uh, uh, four numbers plus one. And I should maybe say that this system, as all other systems I will be talking about, have this property that in this combination with different, there are, uh, the, the, there are different combinations of pluses and minuses, there must be one plus and two minuses. If there is other combination of these uh, frequencies, then the uh, interaction coefficients vanish. So uh, this is, for example, not true for this equation. And that's why this equation is, well, is more difficult than the equation I'm talking about. So there is this resonance system. We called it conformal cubic flow. And, and this gives a good approximation uh, on the time scale one over epsilon squared, where epsilon is the size of solution. And this means that if I take a solution of this equation of size epsilon with some initial data of size epsilon, and I take the same initial data for my original equation, and I evolve them together and compare, then the difference between these two solutions will be of size one over epsilon squared on this time scale. And this is the result of bogolubov krivov averaging uh, theorem. Uh, so this is, but, but this is a long but finite time scale. Eventually, this approximation fails. Uh, this is a Hamiltonian system uh, with uh, a, a quartic Hamiltonian, which looks like this. And there are many other Hamiltonian systems of this form uh, where well, they arise in different applications. So the simplest one is, uh, is the system for which all these interaction coefficients are set to one and the frequencies are one. This equation is called the cubic sego equation and this is a artificially designed equation by uh, French mathematicians, Patrick Gerard and Sandri Grelier, who have studied this system uh, and uh, and uh, basically uh, almost everything is known about this system, but this doesn't come from any natural uh, wave equation. This was designed to study the phenomenon of weak turbulence. Uh, the same system arises in the studies of gross pitayevsky equation in two special dimensions and in so-called lowest Landau level approximation. So in the lowest Landau level, so LLL stands for lowest Landau level. In this case, these frequencies are one, and the interaction coefficients have this form. This was derived two years ago, again, by, uh, by two French mathematicians. And, well, and, uh, and finally, the same resonance system arises in the studies of Einstein equations with negative cosmological constant. Well, in this case, I did not display the formula for, for these coefficients because they are extremely complicated. So it takes several pages to write them down. So, uh, so but, but this was derived by two groups, one in Perimeter Institute and one group in Brussels. They got the same result. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> no. 
these people derived this analytically, they did it numerically. And the result of analytic, so, so yeah, they match, yes. Okay, so let me tell you what are the basic <coughs> properties of systems of this form. So this is this. So first of all, it obviously has a scaling. It has some symmetries, and so it obviously has a scaling symmetry. So uh, as you can see from this form, this is a homogeneous function of degree three. Uh, it has a, a two gauge symmetries. One is a global phase shift, and one is a local phase shift. And this local, well, the global phase shift is obvious because there is one alpha bar and two alphas, but it is less obvious that there is this local shift, and the local shift is, is related to the fact that there is two plus, one plus and two minuses in the interactions. So, so. The works, uh, for some it must be this, this n plus j minus k. If the also the coefficients s must be. No, the coefficients don't play. R well, as long as they have this property that they vanish if this force index, yeah. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, I mean, that is, yeah. these, these equations are on the fourth chapter. I mean, they also occur in the solid state physics. This is the sure. harmonic model of a, of sure. a solid with the, with the, with sure. the interaction. And most of this is what the solid state physics is called Hoopla process. Yeah. Uh, this Two uh, gauge symmetries are Netter symmetries, and from them there follow two conserved quantities, which I will call Q and J. Uh, and the physical interpretation of these conserved quantities depends on the physical context. So, so for, for example, for the gross pitayevsky equation, this would be the number of particles and this would be the angular momentum. Uh, while for anti this uh, uh, would, uh, well, this wouldn't have an obvious physical interpretation. This would be just a linear energy. Now, Mate. Is there an assumption concerning the behavior of these coefficients for large M? Uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, as you, as you saw on, for example, on the previous slide. Well, 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 your question, well, the answer is trivial in this case because they are all one. But for example, in this case, uh, if you work out this, how this behaves for large n, you find that they decay. Which means that, uh, well, you would expect that if these coefficients will grow as indices go to ultraviolet, you would expect that this would enhance turbulent behavior, right? Because it would enhance transfer of energy to high frequencies. And in fact, these which I have not displayed have this property, that they grow in ultraviolet. These remain fixed and these decay. Yeah, thanks for asking this. So, well, the first question, mathematically, is whether actually evolution exists. So it's not quite obvious, but it uh, was shown that for these three examples I gave, SEGO, conformal flow, and the lowest Landau level, the solutions exist locally as long as this quantity is, is, is finite. And because it's conserved, it means they exist globally. However, for Einstein's scalar anti the Sitters system, uh, we have evidence that they become singular in finite time. And this is directly related to instability of anti the Sitter. So I, I will show you this in a moment. Now, so what you, well, well, you can do many things having such infinite dimensional system. I will just, because I don't have time to talk about all aspects, I decided to concentrate on one thing, but this is probably most important. Namely, when you have infinite di dimensional dynamical system, uh, the first question is whether there are finite dimensional subspaces 
such that if you put initial data on, a subs on this subspace, solutions remain on this subspace. Then, in fact, your system becomes finite dimensional. And you can use all uh, powerful techniques for finite dimensional systems. So this is a question of existence of so-called invariant manifolds. So that's, and well, the obvious invariant manifold for this system is uh, if, you t if you start with one mode, if you start with one mode, you stay with one mode. You cannot generate anything else. You will remain with one mode. It is not true for this equation. So you need at least two modes to generate transfer of energy. But, but more, more, much more interestingly, there are three-dimensional invariant manifolds. And they are, for these uh, three examples I gave, they have this form. So it means that if the, this uh, Fourier, generalized Fourier coefficients, alpha n, complex coefficients, uh, have this form, uh, so, for example, here, so this is like, they are parameterized by three complex functions, B, P, and A, functions of time. So this is invariant in the sense that if I substitute this form into the system, I will get a three-dimensional system, closed system, for these functions, A, B, and P. And this system will have this form. And remember, we had three conserved quantities. Q, J, and the Hamiltonian. So therefore, this is a three-dimensional Hamiltonian system with three conserved quantities which are in involution, so this is completely integrable in the sense of Liouville. Uh, such an uh, invariant manifold is unfortunately unknown if it exists for Einstein scalar ADS system, and this is rather hopeless in view of compli com complicated form of these coefficients. Mm. And the numerical evidence is not conclusive. So, so for example, this is for this conformal cubic flow. These equations, which I wrote schematically before, have this form. Uh, uh, they look rather complicated, but uh, this is just an exercise in mechanics. So, well, students usually do exercise for two-dimensional integral system, but this is a three-dimensional system. And if you do this exercise, you find that actually the solution is a, because this is, you are guaranteed that this, if you you can introduce action angle variables in which this is just a, a system of uncoupled harmonic oscillators. And the quantity of interest is y, which is uh, p squared over 1 minus p squared. And, and, the re and the reason is that, well, whenever you have a, whenever you have a sequence alpha n, which is, uh, uh, which is summable, you can associate to this sequence a function uh, so this is a function of time. You can associate a function, u t of z, which is alpha n of t z to n. So this is a function for which these are, this is, these are coefficients of the Taylor series expansion. And because this is, uh, of this, because of this property, this function is analytic in the disk of radius one. And, and as you see from this form that there is p to power n, as p, if I would substitute alpha n to this, so this condition will be lost when the modulus of p becomes bigger than one because the geometric series is not convergent. So, <coughs> Uh, so for this reason, when P approaches one from below, well, this quantity Y goes to infinity, and we have, in fact, the phenomenon that energy flows to arbitrary high f frequencies of energies. And for this system, it's very easy, well, to compute these uh, turning points for these harmonic oscillators in terms of conserved quantities, and you find that this has an upper bound for y, so y cannot go to infinity, which means that this 
cascade is impossible for this system. Uh, however, if you do the same thing for this artificial equation, a cubic Sego equation, which has a similar invariant manifold, and say you take two mode initial data, so there is mode one, with, which is perturbed by a little bit of mode zero. If, if epsilon was zero, we would stay with mode one, but we add an arbitrarily small perturbation of, of the fundamental mode. We can solve this analytically, and uh, this function p, which, which governs the possibility of weak turbulence, can be uh, found explicitly. This was done in one of the papers. It has this form. And you can see from this form <coughs> that this quant modulus of this function approaches one arbitrarily close, actually, uh, when epsilon is small, at a sequence of times for which this sign is one. When this sign is one, then p is arbitrarily close to one. And then returns. And this is the plot. This is a plot of this function. This is a complex function. This is a plot of this function on the complex plane. Uh, and for some small value of epsilon. And you see a, a, a sequence of direct and inverse cascades. So dynamics is quasi-periodic. It's not weak turbulence. It grows and returns. But having that, one can show that for other initial data, not two more data, there exist solutions for which, well, let's say this norm becomes unbounded. So this is uh, one of the very few models in which we know that weak turbulence holds. Now, so now I come to, 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 to the... To, 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 to what was in the title, ADS and B uh, and Bose-Einstein condensate. So, so what is anti de Sitter spacetime? Uh, this, is a, this is a metric of anti de Sitter spacetime. You recognize here that this is uh, the same metric as before. This is uh, Einstein cylinder. So this is the metric on the, uh, on the Einstein cylinder, except that this uh, uh, angle x does not go from 0 to pi as for the sphere, but it goes from 0 to pi half. So it goes from 0 to the equator. So it's a, so it's a, so, so and, and this is this x goes from 0 to pi half on, on the equator. <coughs> But this metric is the, uh, well, has a conformal factor which, uh, which diverges as we approach the equator. So if I, would, if I would set t equal to constant, this is a, a, a hyperbolic space. This is a space of constant negative curvature. And this is a maximally symmetric solution of Einstein equations with negative cosmological constants. So Ricci uh, tensor for this, uh, for this uh, uh, space-time is proportional to the metric with this coefficients which depends on dimension. And this L is a so-called ADS radius, which is a length scale set by the cosmological constant. And this pro space time has very peculiar uh, uh, causal properties, uh, which can be seen on this uh, conformal diagram, which is a two dimensional representation of this space time. So angular variables are neglected here. So this is the center, x equals zero. This is the boundary. And you see from this that if x is pi half, the conformal metric, this, well, the equator, is a time-like, is a time-like boundary. So, and moreover, because of this factor, the distance from any point inside, 
inside is usually called a bulk because, well, maybe I should say that ADS spacetime is very popular since, uh, well, more or less 20 years because of, uh, well, string theory motivations, which I don't want to go into. Uh, but anyway, the distance from any point to the boundary is infinite. However, null geodesics get their infinite time. So this is rather counterintuitive. Uh, so this is a, a plot of some, uh, well, ray which goes to infinity and we must tell this photon what to do next when it reaches the boundary, uh, so which is a manifestation that this spacetime is not globally hyperbolic. So it's not enough to impose initial conditions, you must impose boundary conditions to have a well-defined dynamics. Uh, to make sense of dynamics. So this is just ADS, but more interesting are so-called asymptotically ADS spacetimes, which uh, have the same structure at infinity as this, but maybe very different inside. So it can contain horizons and um, so, for example, there is a Schwarzschild version of AD, uh, asymptotically well, of ADS spacetime. And this spacetime is, is important because it's a ground state among these asymptotically uh, ADS spacetime. So it means a least energy solution, much as Minkowski spacetime is a ground state for asymptotically flat solutions. And for Minkowski, we know that Minkowski is stable. This was, uh, well, no one doubted ever that it is unstable. Well, uh, so, uh, but the, the proof is another story. This uh, was proved by Christodoulou and Kleinman in a monumental work. Uh, however, there is no, very little is known about stability of this because the problem is much more challenging for the reason I, I, I mentioned at the beginning. So, so uh, six years ago, we, after studying this problem for five years, we conjectured with uh, Andrzej Rostworowski, my collaborator, that ADS is in fact unstable. Uh, we, we did it for a simplified model when this is a, a, a spherically symmetric situation. For spherically symmetric situation, we had to add a matter field because otherwise there would be no dynamics. Uh, and we added a massless scalar field. And uh, why did we conjecture this? Well, there, there were several reasons. So first, well, the linear spectrum is, well, I did not write it, but, the, well, I think the, it was on one of the slides, is uh, fully resonant. So it means that, that all linear frequencies are equidistant. So you can form infinitely many resonances. Uh, so you expect that there will be a, a violent flow of energy to high frequencies. And because this system is gravitating, when you concentrate energy on smaller and smaller scales, you expect to form a black hole. So this was a heuristics. And this heuristics was supported by numer numerical evidence. We found that when we took initial data, some say a Gaussian, a small perturbations of anti deciter of very small size epsilon, and we waited long enough, and this, well, that's why it took so long. Not that simulations lasted so many years, but it was so difficult to write the code, which evolved this in a stable manner for so, such a long time, because you have to control well, the waves go to inf and, and bounce back, and, and they bounce back thousands of times. Uh, and each, at each bounce, there is an error generated numerically, and you have to control this error to get to such enormous times. Uh, is there any conservation law here that could help to... There is energies conserved, and there are these two other... That's correct. There are special integrators which uh, guarantee conservation laws exactly, yes. This helps, but this is not enough. Uh, so we found that on this time scale there was a black hole formation. 
Now, of course, numerically, it is impossible to go to arbitrarily small epsilon. So this left some shadow of doubt whether really there is this instability what, well, for arbitrarily small perturbations. Maybe if perturbation is small enough, this effect will be gone. And, and we return to this problem having this resonant. After these people, which, whom I mentioned, derive this system, we solve the resonant and analyze this system uh, both analytically and numerically. And we found that this system, solutions of this system, and note that for this, this system is scale invariant. So the size epsilon is gone. So it doesn't matter. So, so, so and we found the solutions become singular in finite time. And this is today the best evidence that this conjecture is true. I should maybe say that for other, very recently, half a year ago, uh, a young mathematician, a PhD student actually from Princeton, proved this conjecture uh, as a mathematical theorem, but for a different meta model, uh, so called null dust. And, and the, the, the null dust is a simpler matter model than scalar field because it propagates on null geodesics. Uh, it's a very beautiful idea, uh, uh, but it's not clear whether this mechanism will, will work. And from this, his proof, this is a proof of instability, but there is no estimation of, of, of the time of instability. So it's not clear if this is the same time scale. Georgios Moschidis. He's a PhD student of Michalis da Fermos. Of? Michalis da Fermos. Uh, oh, so this is a plot from uh, our paper uh, from 2015 with uh, Andrzej Rostrowski and Maciej Maliborski, my PhD student, which compares solutions of these Einstein equations with a scalar field with solutions of the corresponding resonance system, which is an approximation. And this approximation is shown by solid lines and the full system, uh, with solutions for the full system for different amplitudes, is shown by these dashed lines. And, and this n is the number of modes at which, w when we solve numerically this infinite dimensional dynamical system, we have to truncate it. We, we cannot evolve infinitely many modes, right? And of course, uh, the higher the truncation, the better, but it takes time. So the, the time of the cost of numerical simulations grows rapidly with, with the truncation. And you can see that this is the best truncation we had uh, two years ago. Uh, well, it, 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 so the conjecture is that, in fact, this resonant approximation reproduces the f solutions of the full system if the number of modes goes to infinity, which is impossible in practice. Okay, so finally, let me get to Bose-Einstein condensate. So first, I would, I, I'm showing you a rather amusing uh, calculation, which I have learned first from my collaborator, Oleg Yevnin, and recently uh, from Gary Gibbons, uh, so we, who, 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 who saw some deep facts behind that. So this is an antidecitor metric, which was before, but written in a, in a different coordinate, radial coordinate r, which is related to this angle x, uh, it's tangent x, when x goes from 0 to pi, so r goes from 0 to infinity, this is ADS metric. And we have this cubic klein gordon equation on ADS, and I, I have all physical constants here, so with a cubic nonlinearity. And let's substitute for phi this expression. And we take a double limit. We take L going to infinity, the ADS radius goes to infinity. This is a limit when ADS goes to Minkowski. So cosmological constant goes to zero. So then it's Minkowski. And simultaneously, C goes to infinity, which is a non-relativistic limit. But we take this double limit in such a way that the ratio of C over L is constant. 
and it's omega. And then you get gross Pitayevsky equation. And this harmonic potential in gross Pitayevsky well, comes from this R squared here. Well, this calculation has been known probably already to Schrodinger, well, not for anti de Sitter, but if you do the same thing, well, you get Schrodinger from Klein Gordon. But it seems to me that this observation that if you do this well known thing, but for anti de Sitter, you get, because of course, you, if you do it for Minkowski, you get Schrodinger, but without a potential. Yeah, right. In this limit, the nonlinearity doesn't play any role. So, so this is, uh, but this is the, well. This was observation afterwards. This is not how, why we got interested in gross Pitayevsky. Okay, but anyway, let me tell you what are the parallels between ADS and so. So this is well. This again, a two-dimensional gross Pitayevsky <laughs> equation, which is just a nonlinear Schrodinger equation with a harmonic, well, in this case, isotropic. Uh, uh, harmonic oscillator and this nonlinearity. Well, uh, G is a coupling constant. Uh, I took the, well, we have the sine plus, which means it's a repulsive, but the same properties would hold if this was attractive because solutions are small. Uh, so this is, as well, you know much better than me, this, uh, this is a believed to be a good model uh, for uh, uh, a macroscopic wave function of the Bose-Einstein condensate. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so, well, we can solve, of course, the linear problem, the linear shredding equation, expand the general solution of this nonlinear equation in, uh, in terms of linear, linearized modes. And, and there is note that there is this factor e to minus i, i e n t, which means that we are in the interaction picture. We are in the interaction picture, and these are these are eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator. The, the, the eigenstates have energy n plus one, so this is a fully resonant system, and the angular momentum index m ranges from minus n to n every second. Uh, 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 every second number. And now let's make a truncation that we take only modes with maximal uh, uh, angular moment. So m is equal to n. So this is, so if I so if this is m and this is n so Right. So these are, and, and we are taking only this. Well, if, you took, if we took this, this would be a spherically symmetric, m equals zero. So, so we take these maximally uh, rotating modes. In this case, the eigenstates have this simple function, and this, uh, they belong to so-called bergman fox space. So this is a, a, a Gaussian times a, an analytic function. So z is it's convenient to use a complex a complex coordinate z rather than x and y. Uh, so so we restrict in this sum to m equal n, and we also go to a frame which rotates with angular velocity one. So it's, it's convenient. So because in such a rotating frame, the centrifugal force cancels the harmonic force. So, uh, and this is, uh, so if this is a, a wave function, this one in the laboratory frame, this is the wave function in the rotating frame with uh, frequency one. And this is, uh, 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 well, this has this form as before. So we look at the generalized Fourier expansion. And 
this infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system I wrote before was the Hamiltonian system for these coefficients. Uh, and now, one of the most interesting features of Bose-Einstein condensate is nucleation of vortices when you steer the condensate. And, and actually, using these ideas, one can find exact solutions describing this motion of vortices. Because this system has this three-dimensional invariant manifold I mentioned before. And the wave function for this three-dimensional invariant manifold has this, has this form, when B, A, and P are some complex function which satisfy this three-dimensional integrable system. Uh, now, uh, vortices correspond to zeros of the wave function. So, as you can see from this form, this ansatz has unfortunately exactly one zero or no zeros because this is a linear function. So we, in this setting we can only describe the motion of one vortex but we can do it exactly. So, and so this is a picture but this is just the solution is explicit. This is an explicit solution describing the motion of the vortex and this motion corresponds, the, the vortex is moving o on a circle with some constant, uh, with some constant frequency, but the radius of this circle is slowly modulated. It's slowly modulated, so it's in spiraling and out spiraling. And well, it's probably this. Well, well, of course, people have seen both in numerical simulations and in experiments motion of a single vortex, but not in this regime, because for this approximation to work, the coupling constant must be small. This works when this coupling constant is sufficiently small. Well, I was told by people well, in Krakow working on condensates, that there are methods to make this, to manipulate this G and make it small, but I don't know if this was done in practice for such rapidly rotating condensates. So we saw similar pictures, but the modulation was much, much faster than what we have here. So uh, Now, we are now working on generalizing this uh, these uh, solutions to multi-vortex solutions, so, uh, which would be, of course, much more interesting. <coughs> but, uh, well, so maybe, so that's more or less all I want is, I can show you some movie describing many vortices in this, in this. Uh, so these are the zeros of the wave function uh, well, this is a numerical simulation of our solution, of our system of equations, showing the motion of vortices, starting from two modes. Uh, and uh, we have reasons to believe that this motion... But this is full gross behavior. No, this is, a, this is the approximation. Expanding yeah, and this is a numerical simulation. This is a resonant approximation, but we have reasons to believe that uh, that this can be described analytically. Okay, thank you very much. Going back to ADS, uh, you have used the scalar field and the now dust. What about electromagnetic field? If you the problem with electromagnetic field, which would be very interesting, is that in, for Einstein equations uh, we have so-called Birkhoff theorem, which says that there is no dynamics in spherical symmetry. And this still holds true if you add electromagnetic field. So it means one cannot study Einstein electromagnetic with Einstein Maxwell in spherical symmetry. You, you have to go to at least axial symmetry, and this is uh, difficult. Yeah. So, well, people started doing, but... Yeah. Uh, I have two comments. The first comment is about the weak turbulence. The 
That's correct. Well, this is this goes back to well, this is the father of this is Vadimir Zakharov. Uh, uh, this is called weak or wave turbulence, mainly used in oceanography. Well, thanks for this comment, but but this relation is because well, this uh, what you are uh, well, this this theory is based on so-called, also on a double limit, but a different one, when the size of the system goes to infinity and the size of, of, of solutions goes to, epsilon goes to zero. And the proper uh, 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 ordering of this limit is a little bit obscure, and on top of this, this is a statistical theory. So the equations which govern these weak turbulence are kinetic equations, like Boltzmann equation. Well, this is one of the very hot topics now in, in, in PDE theory to make sense of what you are talking about. Because all these studies, these are studies which are not rigorous. And it's not clear if the spectra, if the, but I wouldn't be worried by this. But what I would be worried that the spectra they see, like Kolmogorov spectra, uh, which actually is a little bit different what I, because you know, the, Exactly, yes. So you have, a, you have a flow, the energy is flowing in, and there is a sink that the energy is dissipated. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you... Yeah, but, but there, are, there are mixed opinions whether these spectra really are confirmed empirically. Well, so called cut, cut. Has this, and we know that the multiple uh, multi vortex solutions do exist, and we know that they form a lattice, and we know that they form a triangular lattice, and we know that the stability of the triangular lattice has been established. Well, as you, as you make this comment. <laughs> As you make this comment, I have the feeling that you were a reviewer of our papers. We, s we were, s we were, <laughs> well, for the first time <laughs> in my life, I submitted a paper to Physical Review A, which is a condensed matter physics. And the comment, of course, was, well, along these lines. We have seen this in experiments and numerical experiments. So what's the big deal that you have an exact solution? So we know this, right? <laughs> No. Well, this is. Uh, well. Anyway, my comment is. 
Well, first, no, first of all, Tkachenko modes, Tkachenko modes that you mentioned are just uh, linearization around the abricots of lattice, and actually there are waves propagating. This is linearization. Uh, while the existence of triangular lattice is a, is a question of the ground state of the system. So, what I'm talking about is dynamics. It's, it's a different thing. I, I'm looking at dynamical solutions uh, which describe motion of vortices. Vortices is not uh, equilibrium. Uh, and, of, and the main goal is whether these solutions... But you know, the, but nothing what I said would apply to to helium because this is a weak coupling regime. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, that we don't know because we don't know what is the super helium we have an expert on who wants to say something. Uh, I have two small comments. The first about this weak turbulence that work is that uh, experiments in context of Bose-Einstein Bose condensate with weak turbulence are being intensively done by Valderlei, Bagnato, and San Paolo. And he is looking into how this energy introduced in some large length scale goes to... So this is only the comment, that there are very nice and a lot of nice experiments. And the second, related to these vortices, you've been told correctly in Krakow, probably by Kuba, that G equals zero is accessible in experiment by first back resonances is being done and this is a standard procedure. The problem is that here you have very rapidly rotating condensate with frequency which is equal to the trap frequency. Yeah. And then the system becomes unstable because, as you said, centrifugal force yeah. balances the... Uh, so this is the main problem. One has to go not to the if somebody, because people want to see this, 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 uh, the, the, this Landau vortices, uh, and uh, they cannot do it in trap. If they want to see it, they have to go to unharmonic traps. Okay. So it so means that. Just experimental. So therefore, the, the problem is that system is not stable. So this picture is not accessible in experiments. Oh, if you have smaller frequency, mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how, mm -hmm. how crucial it is that the frequency is equal to the trap frequency. We have such simulations from very old times about dynamics of plenty vortices, but they were created artificially by some method and we were looking numerically. So it is not exactly the, it's not the exact solution. It's mm -hmm. a numerical solution. Like that comments on this note that you need to have non, 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 non harmonic trap reminds me now um, yeah. from the time when I was busy with superfluid helium and that was in prehistorical times. There's a strictly mathematical paper by Mark Cutts ah. on uh, the creation of the Feynman Monsanger vortices in the helium. And that was a paper on the dose condenser. It was the, the it was in the context of a helium. And the theory was that it, I don't know whether it has any relation but if you have a rotating cylinder on the wall of which we have an infinitesimal bump and when it rotates then, it, then there is an exact solution if I assume I recall it correctly then the vortex 
is created by the bump. And it is moving, it is completely dynamic. Because, I mean, you can argue that the onset resolutions are static, but that was purely dynamic. I must have looked up in my notes where when these cuts. It was cuts or nothing, or cuts by yourself, or, cut, or cuts with hammer. Well, I, 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 I mean, anyway, Mark Katz was the. <coughs> <coughs> First one is, uh, you mentioned something about the problems of short term resistance for this type of thing, uh, for this evening, the dimensional Hamiltonian systems. And my question is, how do you prove that all this local uh, existence if you don't have the Lipschitz theorem? Uh, what do you need to do? Well, no, this is, uh, <coughs> well, I'm probably not the best. Uh, uh, person to answer this question, but uh, it would be better if one of my mathematics uh, collaborators would answer this. But as far as I, I understand, this is just a textbook result in this case because, well, you control, well, these conserved quantities control the two lowest Sobolev norms, and uh, uh, like uh, one half and one h1 half and h1 and this is sufficient to okay uh, so you need you need a backup in, in, in the sense that you need some kind of conserved quantities which uh would yeah of course conservation laws help yeah so yeah but what is nice that once you have a local uh, in time existence in this norm and the norm is conserved you automatically have global in time because it's conserved. Okay, and the second thing is uh, it's just a s s s s idea. S s so I understand that the modes you are considering can be also symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to the um, parity transformation reflection in, in, in the midpoint of, of, of your domain. Right? Which system? So, so the modes you consider, um, they are defined from some zero to some kind of pi. Uh, well, it depends on the system, but basically these modes geometrically uh, can be either uh, symmetric with respect to the midpoint or, or anti-symmetric, right? Yeah, that's correct, because, uh, well, uh, ho however, well, well, it's like, like uh, on the finite interval, you, you can impose, uh, well, Neumann or Dirichlet, so, so this depends on the boundary condition at infinity, so... Uh, for the massless scalar field we considered, there is no choice. You ha only Dirichlet condition is consistent. Okay. But my remark is that these anti-symmetric ones satisfy the same equation, but with, with a zero also in the midpoint. So you can think that they satisfy the same equation, but on a smaller, with, with boundary conditions on a smaller interval. I wonder if this somehow helps in understanding their dynamics. No, but this, uh, uh, but but there is only one geometrically fixed boundary. So, so, so of course, at the linear level, well, yeah, that's true. That well, it would be like notes on the guitar string, so which vanish at some. But this will be gone in non-linear regimes. So. But you could continue. Then you could take such that they have two notes, etc. Yeah. It's restricting the number of modes. That's correct, yeah. If there are no more questions, we thank you again.